Good morning. Welcome to the Mosaic of Christian Belief study here at Trinity Episcopal Parish. If you have not tuned in to last week's particular lecture, please do visit um, at some point in time and see exactly how um, we are discussing the book, because there are some really important things we talked about last week of his methodology, how he's approaching the Christian belief spectrum, and how we're going to talk about this moving forward. This week, we're talking about the first substantive stuff that we're going to get to today. And so for you who have been dying to actually talk about theology, now's when we start. So, you know, strap on your helmets, and let's get ready to do some theology. For you who are uh, tuning in live right now, Please do uh, engage in the comments. Um, what, did you, what did you think worked about the chapter? What did you think was questionable about the chapter? What are things that you're taking out of this moving forward? Feel free to comment. Feel free to do that. Please keep it civil. This is difficult stuff that we're talking about, and we're going to have differences of opinion. And that's okay, because that's the point of the Mosaic Christian belief. This week, we are talking about... Revelation. We're not talking about the book of the Revelation of St. John. Revelation as a concept. And in the Christian tradition, Revelation is one of the places we start when it comes to Christian theology. Because what we know is revealed about God directly affects how we believe and how we act as it comes to our Christian life and practice. What we understand about how God reveals himself, or if he does at all, and what God reveals, and why that's important, directly affects how we live our Christian life and affects so many things about our Christian theology. To get started, Revelation is an assumption we as Christians have because we believe God wishes to reveal himself. We believe that God wishes to be made known. God wishes to reveal himself to us. That's something that we take as a basic proposition of revelation. For us in the Christian tradition, how God reveals himself is now how we are going to discuss what Christian tradition has said about revelation. The way that Roger Olson is going to treat this in his book, Mosaic of Christian Belief, and by the way, for the rest of the book, he's going to treat it in exactly the same order, is that he's going to talk about what are the basic consensus within the tradition, what are the alternatives in opposition, or at least in, in, in a somewhat of a difference to the tradition, and then what are the good diversity of beliefs within the tradition, and how can we find a unitive theory of revelation within that diversity. So we're going to start with what is the consensus of the tradition as it comes to revelation. We start out by defining what we mean by revelation. In its very basic form, Roger Olson says something along these lines. Revelation is God's making known of himself. God's revealing of himself. And within the Christian tradition, the revealing of his own self involves two particular things that are universally held throughout all of Christian tradition. Revelation is both particular and it is general. Oops. Let's see if I can spell today. This is other language you can use for this is special. 
This is another one. And universal. Now, depending on how far down the rabbit trail you, you, uh, you go, you'll have people who disagree with the designation special and general, and you'll have people who disagree with these particular and universal. Olson uses both of these interchangeably, so basically it's like special, particular, general, universal. These are kind of what he's talking about today. But these are the two places, the two places, I'll just go backwards here, these are the two places in which he believes there is consistent and widespread consensus. Now, what do we mean by special or particular and general and universal? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to treat them both in turn. So, Revelation. The first one he talks about is particular. And where we are, where we are, so this is the consensus. So this is where the consensus of the tradition is. Particularly, Christians have always believed that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the unsurpassable and the most unique revelation of God. Across the board, Christians have always believed that Jesus Christ is the most direct revelation of God. Because we believe Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, as we say in the Nicene Creed. Jesus is the universal, or excuse me, Jesus is the particular revelation of God. The special revelation of God. And we find Christ, we find the works of Jesus Christ in the Bible. However, these two things are not the same thing. This is very important for us to understand at the get-go. Jesus Christ, the revelation and the inspired accounts of how Christ lived the earthly life he did, and the resurrection, and now the continual everlasting life that Jesus Christ calls us into, are recorded in the Bible, or Scripture. But we get into problems when we start asking and we start equating these two things. The reason why is actually a very basic historical question. If we say that the particular revelation of God is the Bible, equivocably with Jesus Christ, the question becomes, how do we understand how Christians believed before they had a unitive canon of Scripture? So, this right here, canon, refers to how we got the Bible we got today. How did we decide what books were in it? How did we decide what was divinely inspired? This question of canon actually doesn't get resolved, well, it doesn't get resolved officially until we get to the councils in the 300s. However, the canon was an operative thing already within the Jewish tradition, and so they already had a canon of the Old Testament, those which were divinely inspired, but the question of canon to the New Testament becomes a really important question in the first and second centuries. In fact, um, F.F. Bruce um, says, and, and, and scholars generally agree on this, that the, way that, the, that the way that the Bible begins being circulated is that the Gospels begin being combined together, and St. Paul's letters be, become combined together, and they start circulating throughout the church regions. However, before that, we have to understand the reason why we have four Gospels, and why four of them had different styles. It's because St. Mark, St. John, St. Luke, and St. Matthew are writing for different audiences. 
there are some audiences and some and some um, culture. Oh, excuse me, some communities within the early church, within the you know first 50, 100 years after Jesus uh, after Jesus was re- resurrected, that only had access to certain scriptures. They only had access to the scriptures that their community possessed. Paper writing was very expensive back then. You had to, you had to take papyrus reeds and beat them into, you know, beat them to a pulp, literally, in order to write on them. Or you had to take dried animal hide to write on them. That's expensive. And so the thing is, is that when we equivocate these two things, what we actually do is we actually are actually not paying attention to the tradition, because Jesus Christ Himself is the most particular revelation of God. The reason why this is important is because when the scriptures begin to be actually codified, we have to be able to answer the question, how can we say that that people had the right understanding of Jesus Christ if they didn't have the Bible? The answer is, historically, that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's own self. Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God. The scriptures are divinely inspired accounts of the eternal word, by the eternal word, by the Holy Spirit, but nonetheless, the book ain't person. And I hope that that's okay to say, because we have to kind of understand, in Olson's view, these are not the same thing. Because that creates problems with how we understand how the deposit of faith functions in the early church. But in general, or in particular, Jesus Christ is the particular revelation of God. The particular revelation of God. Which then we have a question of, okay, that's the particular. What is the general then? So we have Jesus as being number one. The particular revelation of God. But... There is also general consensus that there is, in fact, a universal. There is, in fact, a universal revelation of God, or a part, or a general, general. Gosh, I can't spell this morning, can I? A general revelation of God. And that general revelation of God is within the cosmos itself, within the creation. Now, this universal general creation is, we have to be careful with this, Because there is consensus that there is universal general revelation of God in creation. As the Psalms say, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. That the fact that there is a creation created by someone is, in fact, a way that we can get to a reasonable conclusion that there exists a God of some sort. This is exactly the kind of arguments that you see arising within the tradition of the scholastics, within the tradition itself. How do we know that there is a God generally, so to speak? Thomas Aquinas gets at this by his five ways argument. Um, How do we understand that there is a first cause to begin with? Because he treats God as first cause of everything in an Aristotelian sense. We also get at this in a different way of... Uh, we can posit that there is teleology within the creation. There is a goal-orientedness to things. There is an order to creation. There is a fine-tune to creation. These are all ways that we universally or generally come to the argumentative knowledge of God through the creation of the cosmos. But this revelation right here is, at best, impersonal so it doesn't reveal a personal God it doesn't reveal a God who is intimate with the creation it's an impersonal but it's also an incomplete it's an incomplete picture 
Because the thing is, is that our ways of knowledge within the world, using our reason, our ways of knowledge shift. The ways that we understand things that are knowledgeable, things that are reasonable, shift depending on what our personal integration or our personal engagement with the creation is. So the thing is, is that the universal in general, right here, in the creation of the cosmos, is an impersonal and complete revelation. Like we said, the most particular, the most special revelation of God in the Christian tradition is Jesus Christ himself, the eternal word of God. God within creation. God man. The universal general is the kind of secondary cause in the Aristotelian sense and in, the, and, in the, and in Thomas Aquinas' sense, the idea that there is something rather than nothing, that there is a goal-orientedness to the universe, that there is a order to the universe, there is a fine-tune to the universe, etc., 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 but that we get at this through our reason to an impersonal and incomplete picture. In broad brushstroke, these two things are a general consensus of the Christian tradition, that there are two things in Revelation, the particular in Jesus Christ and the general universal in the creation of the cosmos. That's the general overview of what you can expect within Christian history and tradition. Jumping off of these, jumping off of these two things, which... Jesus and creation. This is where, basically between these two things, particular universal Jesus and the creation, this is where we get into the diversity of belief. This is where we get into ways in which we understand these things and how they operate differently. The first thing that Olson treats with after he treats the consensus is he talks about the alternatives to these things. But it actually circles around these things. The alternative is just how you apply these. The consensus is these two things, and how you apply them is where the alternatives or the diversity comes in. Alternatives for Olson are the things that are outside of norms of Christianity. Diversity, in his third section, are the things in which we are diverse within the Christian tradition. So alternatives are things that he believes are on the gray edge, maybe outside, and diversity is what he believes are definitely central, but have some very hearty disagreement about. What we're going to talk about first is the alternatives to the Christian tradition. So within this polarity... No, it's not polarity. Within these two things, revelation, universal, and particular, now we're going to talk about alternatives. So alternatives. These are your alternatives to the general Christian consensus. Here's how it, this is going to work. You're going to, you're going to see various things that I write up here about what Olson believes are on the exterior gray edge or the outside of the Christian tradition. And the reason why he's going to say that is because these beliefs shift and mess with core Christian conviction. It's not because, it's not because he necessarily doesn't like the idea. It's that what the ideas logically do to other beliefs within the Christian tradition are such that it actually pushes us to a place that is either that is either heterodox, not orthodoxy, or heresy. So here's a couple of things that he talks about. The first is that new revelation, new revelation supersedes supersedes revelation in Jesus. Okay. Let's think very carefully about the wording of this. New revelation supersedes revelation in Jesus. What he's talking about is that any claim of new revelation 
that supersedes or contradicts the revelation found in Jesus is something that messes with the core of the Christian foundation. Because our core in Orthodox Christianity is Jesus is the center. But if Jesus, if the revelation of Jesus gets displaced by new revelation, what does that do to our Christianity? There's a very practical and very tragic uh, example of this. In the 1930s, in Nazi Germany, and you can go back and read about this, the German National Party, and, and then also Hitler himself, co-opts this idea that they are the new revelation, the new revelation of God's will for the world. They are a new revelation that supersedes or takes the place of revelation in Jesus. General brushstroke, broad, can't get into discussion about the exa exact things of this, but you can read about them. What happens is that the German National Party's agenda or Hitler's agenda becomes the revelation that takes the place of Jesus. So, for example, when the agenda of the German national state takes the place of Jesus, what happens is that you have what is understood as a co-opting of Christian faith as a tool for empire. This is exactly what Karl Barth, a really important person to know, this is exactly what Karl Barth fights so hard against in the Barman Declaration. In, in Germany during this time, Karl Barth and a bunch of other German pastors form what's called the Confessing Church. The National Church, some of them actually buy into this into the German national rhetoric about the superseding revelation of the German National Party. Karl Barth and the Confessing Church write the Barman Declaration, and they basically say there, there is no revelation other than Jesus. It is Jesus or it is nothing. Jesus only. In the chapter, you will see uh, how uh, Roger Olson actually talks about Karl Barth's reaction to the German nationals actually probably pushes him in a diverse, uh, a diverse direction in which Karl actually has very little confidence that we can actually know anything about God through creation. So Karl Barth has a very, very minimal, uh, very minimal faith in number two, in general revelation. Karl Barth is not like general re revelation. Karl Barth wants specific because of that, right there, okay? So a lot of theology is actually written in response to something. And so when we talk about theology, often we also need to, we need to talk about what are they responding to? But you see, new revelation supersedes revelation in Jesus. This worked itself out in a very practical way in Germany in the early, in the early 20th century. That is one alternative to Christian faith as held as a consensus. That new revelation supersedes Jesus. When that happens, we're no longer in Christianity. We're outside of it. According to, <coughs> excuse me, according to how Olson describes this. So that's number one. So number one is new revelation supersedes revelation in Jesus. And Karl Barth's response to this. Because of course, as you can see, whenever this happens, it messes with certain things, right? Because if new revelation supersedes that which is found in Christ, we actually have a salvific question, right? We actually have a question over, well, did people before the time of this new revelation actually have salvation? Did they actually have the full revelation of God? Orthodox Christianity answers this in, I think, in a very helpful way, which is that Jesus, the eternal word, was God, was there in the beginning. Jesus ever existed. However, new revelation, that has a lot more problems with it. That's why Olson wants to caution us about that. But number two, this is another alternative. This one is much more, this is one that's much more at home with us who are, who are post-enlightenment. 
Number two is that general revelation supersedes special revelation. Okay. The second one is that general revelation supersedes special. The idea that our reasonable observance of the cosmos, of the universe, supersedes the revelation that we can find in the scriptures. This works itself out in what we call rationalism. So you, talk, you heard me talk about rationalism just a tad bit last time. Let me talk really specifically about rationalism right now. Rationalism, by and large, is the belief that our rational observance of the universe or our rational observance of the scriptures themselves leads to a particular revelation, general revelation, re leads to a particular revelation that supersedes the special. This works out very practically in the denial that miracles exist. So, for example, when we are looking at what we understand as merely literature, as merely history, as merely the things that we are recording about Jesus, then we start asking the question, well, this is people's impression of Jesus. Maybe they used literary devices to get across how important Jesus was, and this is how they did it through the miracle stories. What that does, though, is it, it basically what it does is that it, makes us question the inspiration of Scripture, which is something that we hold as a core, um, a core theology within the, within the church, that the inspired Scripture is actually reliable. What this particular one assumes is that special revelation is actually subjective, not objective. The idea that the special revelation in the Scriptures did not objectively say or did not objectively argue that Jesus bodily raised from the dead. That instead, our observance of culture, of time, of mythology, tells us that actually this was an explanatory tool only to get across the importance of Jesus. But what that does is that it, it actually erodes our ability to actually trust what the special revelation says. So what it does, when general revelation supersedes special revelation, general revelation also has a criteria for how we understand special revelation. It imposes its criteria on how we interpret what is actually true and what's not through our observance. This is where we get into trouble when we allow our reason unaided to supersede the scripture. So if you remember the four places that we find our, that, that we find our kind of general sources and norms last week, which, by the way, is a helpful little acronym, REST. So we have, um, we have reason, experience, scripture, and tradition. This is what happens when we allow our reason to supersede scripture. This is what happens. And because that is dicey, we have to be careful about how we understand how complete a revelation can be found in general revelation. Hence, back to Karl Barth's criticism. Karl Barth saw this enacted in the German National Party, this superseding special. And so what, what Barth pushes so hard against is that actually we just, well, we need to just not, we need to not pay attention to this. Now, did Barth go too far in the other direction? That's within the diversity of opinion. But for general revelation to supersede special, that is within the Christian tradition, on the gray area, or outside of the tradition itself. Because it messes with how we understand Christian truth. Number three. So the third alternative. The third alternative in this is that actually avoiding both general and special that subjective personal revelation supersedes again you'll you'll see you see how this word is really important it 
we have to understand what's the proper order of these things. Subjective or personal revelation supersedes both general and most especially, most especially, special. Subjective personal revelation supersedes both general and most especially special revelation. This works itself out in interesting ways. There are a couple of, of different ways that you can look at this, but here's maybe a more clear way of putting this. When one engages with scripture and one believes that one receives a personal revelation from God, that happens, it does happen, but a personal revelation of God that contradicts, that contradicts, that contradicts these two, and that becomes your modus operandi, that becomes your source of revelation in spite of what we might see in general and special revelation. Think about it this way. If our subjective personal revelation of God reveals to us that God is angry at those people, that God wishes destruction upon those people, that God wishes to pass judgment on those people, and we forget the special revelation in Jesus Christ that says, though all have sinned, all are forgiven through repentance and baptism, when we personally have that revelation that may we might we might proof text by grabbing certain things out of scripture by grabbing certain things out of general revelation and then supporting our subjective personal that becomes our god that becomes the way that we understand god in spite of differences within both general and special revelation let's take for example Ooh, I don't know if I want to go here, but I'm, going to, but I'm going to go here anyway. Take, for example, Westboro Baptist Church. We know, what the, we, we know generally what, that, what, they, what they will generally stand for. But I want to specifically talk about their protests at military funerals. When we, when we treat the special revelation, they won't, that they won't say that they have a subjective personal revelation. But let's see how this works out. Their special revelation, the Bible of course, is where their, where their operating stuff is from. When they protest someone who has died, what, on what basis do they do it? The special revelation that they, that, that they receive from the scripture, they look at certain things and they say, this is not what God intended. But not just that God did not intend for this to happen, but that it is my duty is my duty to protest at people's funerals. However, if you look a little closer, there is, there is a modus operandi of subjective personal revelation that is shot through that idea. For example, what do we do with the story of God and Naaman in the Old Testament, the commander of the Syrian army who opposes Israel, and God heals him anyway of his leprosy? He didn't become an Israelite. He did not become a Jew. He goes back to Aram, where he is, where he is the Syrian captain, and still serves as a Syrian captain. He worships the Lord Most High, absolutely. But that didn't make him, that didn't make him any less of a military person. How do we understand protesting a military funeral in light of Naaman's redemption? Or Cornelius in the New Testament, when Cornelius is revealed to Peter in a dream, you need to go to Cornelius and you need to preach the gospel to him in his whole household. I might have gotten Peter and Paul mixed up there, my apologies. But the idea is that what do we do with God's redemption of Cornelius, the centurion, a Roman soldier? What do we also do with the Philippian jailer, who's also a soldier? What do we do also with the fact that in the soldier's mouth at the crucifixion of Christ, the soldier in the Gospel of Mark is the only one who calls Jesus the Son of God? 
So we have several things that are pushing back against even the special revelation of the protesting of military funeral and even the general revelation of like war is bad. But we have a subjective personal right here, right? We have something going on right here that is superseding these two things. And that actually causes, I mean, if, if I'm just honest, it causes Christianity to have a bad name in, in some people's mouths. So we have to be careful where our authority lies. Now, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about right now, Now we're going to shift, and we're going to move to diversity in Christian belief, and a unitive measure. So whereas we have certain kinds of things superseding the place of the proper order of things, there is a way that we can get to a general shape of how we, how we deal with these things. So this is where we have diversity. And perhaps some union. Here's where we have diversity. The general revelation between Karl Barth and Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas believes that we can know that God exists by our observance using our reason of the universe. This is also something that Anselm of Canterbury believes, one of our ancestors in the faith. In, in Canterbury, of course, in Anglican tradition. But Karl Barth and a lot of others of that resist general re revelation have a much lower view of how we can understand that. But within Christian tradition, the diversity around general revelation is the following. To what extent, to what extent can we have knowledge knowledge of God through general revelation? To what extent can we have knowledge of God through general revelation? So the diversity in this opinion is demonstrated. Thomas Aquinas, through his observance of the universe, basically lays out there are ways we can deduce that God exists. Now, Aquinas still subjects our general revelation under special revelation. There is no higher revelation than Jesus Christ, but Thomas Aquinas believes we can know something about God through the observance of the natural universe. Bart and others who downplay general revelation believe that there is actually nothing that we can really know about God through merely looking at the universe. Now, these are opposite polarities in some way. Aquinas is probably more towards the middle, but, um, but the idea is that what, to what extent we have knowledge of God through general revelation? That's a question in the diversity of Christian belief. We can have differences as to what extent we can know this. So, like, for example, we can have differences as to whether the fine-tuning argument of the universe actually is convincing. The fine-tuning argument of the universe is that what we can understand about the Earth, there are any number of metrics we can point to about how unique the arising of life is on Earth in comparison to the rest of how we understand the observable universe. The Earth had to be in the basically the perfect place at the perfect time with the perfect tilt of the axis, with the perfect distance from the sun, with the perfect ellipse going around the sun for life to arise. It had to be in such a way that the organic life that we understand could have arisen from it. This is what the fine-tuning argument basically says. And because we can observe that there is a fine tune to the universe, that there is a fine tune to the way that the Earth uh, gave, uh, gave the arising of life to it, that there is a architect that has constructed these things. There is an order to the universe. There is a reason. There is a teleology. There is a goal-orientedness in which life arises on the Earth. And... That gives us general knowledge of a higher power, of a god, of a godlike figure, but it doesn't give us personal knowledge. And Thomas Aquinas would say we actually can't do that unless we use, unless we use Holy Scripture. However, it's okay to disagree with the fine-tuning argument as well. 
Because the thing is that by our reasonable knowledge of the fine-tuning, that has a lot of assumptions that go along with how we understand how life works. For example, um, in our explorations of Mars right now um, by NASA, one of the things that we're actually looking for is that we there is, well, it's one of those deals where like there is, there is water on Mars, it's just not the water that we think about. It's, it's as full of perchlorates, it's really bad for us organic beings. But the question that, that NASA is asking is, is life only organic, or can life be inorganic? Is the type of life that we're observing right now between me and you and my, and, and, and my own body right now, is that merely a type of life, and there are other types of inorganic life or different kinds of life out there that we simply have no knowledge about? So the question of the fine-tune becomes, becomes questionable, right? Because if organic life is the only kind of life that there is, fine-tuning works in that sense. But if there is other kinds of life, such as inorganic life, then the fine-tune doesn't work very well. So that's where we have diversity of belief about that. The second place, the second place of diversity is what is the content primarily doing? What is the content of revelation? Is it primarily, is it primarily personal or is it primarily factual? Now this is a very ticky-tack type of thing. The question of the content of revelation. If this, is, if this is obtuse, let me put it this way. In God's revelation of Jesus Christ, was this to reveal the personal aspect of God, or is this to for Jesus to reveal factual information about God? When Christ became incarnate, did Jesus primarily reveal personal information about God, God as Father, God as loving creator, God as intimately um, engaging with the universe through Jesus, or did Jesus come to give primarily factual information about God. God is spirit. Those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth, being a factual statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Factual statement. Is it primarily personal or factual? This one is a little bit ticky-tack. It depends on what your biases is in this. And it also depends really on what you're reacting against. Factual if it's primarily factual, God is communicating facts about us in the universe. Where we get into trouble is in our hermeneutic, is how factual we get it. When the Psalms say that you have established the earth's foundation so firmly it cannot be moved, are we going to be like the Roman Catholic Church in the mid-centuries and say, well, the earth doesn't move, Galileo? Which, of course, we know the aftermath of that. Or is it primarily personal? where it's only about the relationship of God loving the world, of God being intimate with the world, of God doing so, but eschewing factual information. This one is the easiest one, I think, to have a unitive aspect of, because it's both and, as Olson would say. It's both personal and factual. It both reveals the personal relationship of God with the universe and the factual relationship of Jesus revealing factual information about God. And, of course... The idea about our theology has a foundation in the factual. We assume that the revelation of God, especially through Jesus and generally in the cosmos, has a factual claim. Or else, like last time, we then, if it's not factual, we then fall into relativism. Where all religious, all religious belief is... If you remember last week, all religious belief is opinion. If it's not factual, we fall into that. However, if it's not personal, what do you do with the rest of the Bible? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if it's not personal, if it's not revealing a personal God in the Bible, we then result to rationalism, right? If it's not personal, it's only rational. We get a deistic God that is removed from the universe that has pinged off the clock pendulum and has simply let everything work, but we have no person, right? So if it's not factual, then everything's opinion and we're relativists. 
If it's not personal, then we're rationalists, and we believe that God is just this divine thing that is deistic away from us, and that doesn't have anything to do with us. That's what he's avoiding. But, of course, we in the Christian church have always believed that it's both factual and personal. It is a personal re revealing of God, which involves fact. But it also involves the inner workings of God himself, the trinity of persons in divine being, right? So, number two, the diversity is whether it's primarily personal or factual. And these are the things that we're trying to avoid in that. The last one we'll talk about is one that will lead us into next chapter, by the way. Okay. The next one, number three, does Revelation, does Revelation continue? Is Revelation static, came at one point in time no longer, or does it continue dynamically? Does Revelation continue? Here's why this is an important question. If we believe that Revelation is static, that it only happens at one point in time, then what that leads us into is it profoundly affects the way that we understand Scripture, right? It reinforces that Scripture is the particular revelation of God at a specific point in an objective fashion, which is something within the Christian tradition. But if we say that Revelation has ceased, when the canon of scripture was closed, we then have a historical problem. When did it cease? When did the canon become decided? Did the canon become decided at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD? Because if so, we have about 300 years we have left accounted for. Did, revelation, or did the revelation of the, uh, and the inspiration of the Bible become static at the end of the first century? If so, how do we know? So it brings up questions that have difficult historical answers to. Does Revelation continue? It also does something really interesting, which is that um, there is something within the Christian tradition called cessationism. Cessationism has to do with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit gives the gifts of the Spirit, such as prophecy, such as, uh, such as um, healing, such as tongues, all these various things. Cessationists basically say that the reason why the Scripture gifted that to the early church was for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as soon as that was unnecessary, as soon as the gospel of Jesus got its head start, so to speak, the Spirit ceased to give out those gifts. That's what cessationists believe. However, Pentecostal Christians and Charismatic Christians actually resist cessationism by saying, actually, no, no, the Holy Spirit is a continual presence within the church, revealing, prompting, not contradicting the scripture, not contradicting what we believe about God, but enhancing, personalizing, re-speaking, and actively leading the church into where we should go. The idea that, the, that we still speak in tongues if, if we are so given the gift. We still have gifts of healing if we are given the gift. We still have the gift of prophecy if we are given the gift. But cessationism says that it's static. The charismatic tradition says that it is dynamic. It continues. But actually, there's an interesting thing in the, in the Anglican tradition that has to do with how we understand Revelation is continuing that has to do with the tradition. For example, if Revelation is static, tradition means nothing. If Revelation is a static deposit of what happens, the tradition becomes the tradition of exactly what that deposit was. For us Protestants, the tradition would become Scripture itself, right? It becomes the adherence to Scripture. However, the tradition has changed and has progressed over 2,000 years. This is where we get the tradition that we find in the Roman Catholic Church today, and it's profoundly influenced by a man named John Henry Newman. Mm -hmm. 
my theologian friends are rolling their eyes right now because they knew I was going to bring up Newman in this conversation. Um, but Newman is a really important person. John Henry Newman, in the 18th century, Anglican guy who converted to Roman Catholicism, but John Henry Newman spoke of what is called, what, what, we can, what we can term within this discussion as a dynamic tradition. There is, in fact, a progression of revelation in the tradition. We know stuff before that we didn't know before. And that stuff that we know before is, in fact, an outcome of the continuing revelation. That is a very broad brushstroke. It's not nuanced, and it's probably not exactly what John Henry would say. But generally, that's kind of what he talks about. Tradition is a dynamic. It's not a static. It's a dynamic moving of these things. But you see, does revelation continue? That is a subject of discussion within the Christian church. But it also has moral capacity, right? If revelation, did, if revelation did or did not continue, that affects how we live and how we understand the role of Scripture, right? If revelation ceased at, <clears throat> at the codification of Scripture, the Scripture becomes the most important thing we can possibly do. Not that it's not in other traditions, but it's that Scripture becomes the only source for access to the Holy Spirit. In general terms, that's kind of what that means. If Revelation continues, then the extreme side of that is within the alternative to tradition, right? If Revelation continues, that Revelation must be subject. This must be subject to Scripture. And does not supersede it, right? So if Revelation continues, it must be subject to Scripture. And it can't overturn what Scripture has said. The interpretation of what Scripture says can be argued. The interpretation as to what is essential within Scripture will be discussed next week. But the thing is, is that if we believe in continuing revelation, we have to submit that under Scripture, or we risk flipping these two things into, a, into where the revelation displaces Scripture, and we get something as and we get something as extreme as the way that the Nazi German Party co-opted this. So how we keep these in the right order is half the battle. But you'll see the unitive, the union side of knowledge of God in, in the creation, of the content of Revelation and of Revelation continuing, these are places in which we can have legitimate disagreement about these things. And we have legitimate disagreement th about these things for good reason, right? If we believe that we can't have knowledge of God through general Revelation, what does that mean for the natural sciences and our scientists who are confessing Christians? If we can't know something about God through the observance of the universe, what do we do with the Psalms that say the heavens declare the glory of God? But also, if we say that we can have increased knowledge of God that supersedes the special revelation, then that becomes kind of a mirror into our own selves. Our own self becomes the God that we see because it's unmediated by special revelation of God's own, own choosing. Content, of course, personal, factual. The idea of if we eschew the personal, we all of a sudden become rationalists, where we're simply observing de a deistic God. If we eschew the, uh, if we, if we eschew the factual, we, can, we become relativists, where, in the most extreme sense, um, where we then everything is opinion, right? Nothing's factual, everything's opinion. And then, of course, this revelation continues. If we say it's static, we have, we have a question as to how the Holy Spirit continues to move within the church. It makes us question, do we only have access to, 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 the, to the Holy Spirit through Scripture itself, or if Revelation continues, and the Holy Spirit continues to move, and continues to do things, how does that revelation fall in line with how we understand Scripture? And the answer is, is that if we have a revelation that continues, it must be subsidiary to Scripture, within Olson's argument. So that's a lot for this morning. I hope that, that you found something that was helpful in this. But the main thing, the main thing out of all of this is recognize the diversity of, of opinion within the Christian tradition and that there is legitimate diversity in these things. There is legitimate diversity for really good reason and that there is legitimate alternatives, gray area and outside Christianity because it messes with core convictions that we have. 
So as we continue in the Mosaic of Christian belief, next week we are going to talk about chapter 4, and we're going to talk about Scripture. We're going to talk about the particularities of Scripture and how we understand Scripture, both within the tradition, the unitive Christian tradition, and how we understand within our own lives, how do we understand Scripture working practically when we engage with it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, engage with this stuff. Tell me whether you agree with Olson on these points. Tell me if, if there's something off base that happens. Engage with each other in practical ways. Engage with each other, assume the best in each other. Have good conversation about our disagreements. Because we can disagree about these things and still worship God Almighty. I will see you in just a few minutes for our Holy Eucharist over in the over the church building i bid you blessings on whenever you see this video and do uh feel encouraged to stop by more um, if you're in searcy arkansas please do come worship with us we would love to have you here thank you all god bless you